just start off with tell us who you are, where you were raised, okay. why you went in the service, give us your training, and all those stories. It's up to you. You're telling me. Okay. I'm William Kenyon. I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, before we start here, I think we'll just start that over here now we got things. Oh, actually, uh, one thing too, John, if we could start off with uh, where you were born and where. That just kind of gives us a foundation for Okay. okay. Who you are, where you were born, when? I was born in 1920, May in 1920, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, lived there until uh, essentially the beginning of World War II, where I was living with my aunt and uncle in Akron, and uh, I received. I did. I didn't qualify for the first draft, and I really don't know why. I can't remember why, but I was drafted for the the second go-round and I had been going to Akron University and I was involved in the RTC, ROTC program there which was 50 minutes of walking every day carrying a gun and that didn't particularly appeal to me until a friend of mine came home he had been a naval aviation cadet came home and was wearing one of those white uniforms and I thought, boy, that's a real thing to do. So I enlisted in the Navy in August of 1942. Uh, I, was, I was sent to what they called a pre-flight school. No, it was a pre-pre-flight school. The, they were getting so many volunteers in the program, it was getting jammed up and they had to, normally you went to a pre-flight school and then you went to the so-called E-base, which was an elimination base. And I had to go to a pre-flight -pre school and for some reason, I have no idea why, they picked me and about uh, at least five other people in that school I was in, which was at Worcester College in Ohio, picked me to go to an advanced navigation training course in Hollywood Beach, Florida. The condition was that I went out of the Naval Aviation Pilot Training Program and went to this navigation school, and then I would do a tour of duty for one year overseas, or wherever they were going to send me, and then they guaranteed that I would go back and get into the pilot program as an officer, uh, which is actually what happened. Uh, I went to the school that was in Hollywood Beach, Florida, I think I mentioned that. And I was commissioned in uh, August of 1943 and sent to Norfolk, Virginia, where I was joined to join my squadron, which was uh, VPB 114. It's uh, that stood for uh, heavier than air patrol bomber. Unbeknownst to me, that particular squadron and one other, I believe there was just one other, were designated as night uh, anti sub squadrons, and we had a uh, 80 million candlelight searchlight added to the outboard engine and be outboard of number four uh, for identifying items that we would pick up on radar. Well, radar wasn't out and it, it wasn't a staple in the Navy or any place else at that time. And we didn't get the radar put in until we got to uh, Africa, I believe. But the idea was that we would fly at night and use the radar to identify something on the surface of the Atlantic or Pacific, wherever you happen to be. Hopefully it would be a periscope because in those days, I think the the convoys that were taking material to specifically to England and to Russia would leave the states in a group of about 20 and would be lucky if two of them got through. And we were to fight, and we, the Navy, we had no defense at nighttime and the submarines, you know, ran on the surface to charge their batteries. So we were, 
equipped and identified as a nighttime anti-sub patrol squadron. Uh, we went over to, uh, we were to stage out of England during uh, D-Day. Uh, and our route to get to England, I thought was kind of unusual. And most of the time when they were ferrying planes for the Air Force, uh, they went up to Greenland and Iceland and then back down into England. But for us, for some reason, they sent us down, first of all, to West Palm Beach, and we staged down to Trinidad and then to Belém, Brazil, across to the Ascension Island, and then to Africa at a place called Dakar. And from there, we then went up across the Atlas Mountains at Marrakesh, and were based in a town called Port Leote, which is about 16 miles north of Casablanca. I didn't see uh, any of the movie people from the movie but there, but uh, at least we were near it. And we operated in a training basis from there up, uh, up to and out of Gibraltar frequently. For, Gibraltar was about an hour flight time away. And we were patrolling the inner side of the entrance to the Mediterranean. And at Gibraltar, it's only about five miles wide. And they finally decided that um, it was kind of an expensive operation to send us up there. And uh, we had these B-24s and we carried about 3,600 gallons of gas and we could fly for up to 15, 16 hours at a time. But they replaced us on the Gibraltar Strait, the entrance, uh, entrance with um, blimps. And uh, I thought that was a, a real fine thing to do because the blimps could just cruise over there at about five knots and we were doing 140. And uh, that's, it's, it's easier to have the radar pick up something uh, from the five knot speed. At any rate, we were the one of the first squadrons to have uh, radar had a 90 mile range on it. Uh, it took the place, they took a, 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 a tunnel turret was on, came with the B-24s. They took that out and put the radar uh, shell in that spot. And then where the, the, there was a room for a gunner in the bow of a B-24 and also a navigator, and there was a little uh, bubble up there where the navigator would operate from. We re replaced the navigator with um, a searchlight operator, and he had what looked like a yoke uh, that you have in the flight. The pilot has operates with a yoke, and he could operate that light uh, directionally and turned it on from that little bubble he was looking out when the radar operator identified some sort of a blip on the radar and we would drop down to 50 or 100 feet to, to home in on it. It took, when you got within a minute's flight time of the blip that you'd picked up on the radar, the operator, light operator, would turn it on, but it was an 80 million candle power arc light, and it took about 30 seconds for that carbon arc thing to ignite and get you some light. And then they'd try and home in on whatever the blip was on the radar, and by then you're uh, probably 15 or 20 seconds away from that particular item, whatever it might be. And one night when we turned it on, we were a little tardy and uh, all of a sudden there was a good big black wall in front of us and it turned out that it was the Queen Mary. Uh, she crossed the, the Atlantic regularly and with always with 10,000 troops going east and I don't know how many of the wounded were coming back on her when she went west, but she could go so fast that the there was no German sub that could keep up with her, and uh, that's what we were looking for. I don't know how many times we dropped uh, depth charges, but at night you can't see anything. You, you, get, you have a 
blip on the radar and uh, you drop the bomb and it goes off, you can hear it and see it, and, but you don't know whether you hit anything. The results are certainly indefinite. I have no idea what, what we did. And from that, uh, I was there. We were in England. We got there about the 10th, of, uh, 10th or 12th, I think, of uh, June after D-Day had, had its bad uh, results going on Omaha Beach and that sort of stuff. And we were in England to probably until September. And then they sent us down to the Azores because the, <coughs> the uh, results of the nighttime patrol were very successful uh, in controlling the submarines and they're trying to, to hit, uh, sink the Kaiser ships, That's the big old uh, <laughs> ugly transports that carried all the supplies and so forth across the Atlantic. But we, just the bare fact that we were there flying at night and had the ability to identify them uh, both by radar and also light them up so we could see what we were doing it was very successful. And I stayed there until uh, December of uh, 44, I guess, yeah, 44. And then came back to the States and went through flight school at uh, at Tumwa, Iowa, in Pensacola, Florida. Let me interrupt you, Bill. Uh -huh. We tended to skip over a little bit of your <coughs> of your training. Um, for example, I don't even I didn't even get from you what your duty is in this particular function. Were you the navigator, the yes. pilot, pilot, navigator? I was a navigator. Okay. Okay. And <coughs> were you, weren't you in the V five program? Yes. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Well, I didn't hear about the New York City brownout. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to go on to time here because we're kind of okay. See, what was the V five program? The V five program was the aviation cadet program, pilots, and they that's the program they. I was always in the V pro V five program, but they took me out instead of putting me directly into pilot training. They diverted me to navigation training. I did the tour overseas and then went back into the flight training program. And for me, that was very fortunate because later on when I was down in Pensacola and learning to fly PBYs and that sort of stuff, I ran into some of the guys that I'd been in the pre-flight program prior to going overseas and they were still aviation cadets. They hadn't gotten into being commissioned and by then I was a JG in the officers program. So far as the New York brownout thing, during the war, uh, I suppose we all overreacted about what, uh, because the Japanese you know, floated some bombs over from Japan, over, landed in Canada, some of them in Washington. Nobody knew what was going to happen in some of our major cities, one of which, of course, is New York City. And when I initially joined my squadron, it was in Norfolk, and we had to go up to Providence, Quonset Point, Rhode Island, for final training. And in doing so, we just followed the coastline across in front of New York City and eventually got to Providence. And at that particular time, we were it was Christmas Eve, I remember that, of 43, yeah. Um, all the East Coast cities had been under a brownout. You turned out almost all of your lights. So there were very, very few. You remember, or you don't remember, but in England they all drove at night with little slits over the headlights and the same thing here. And as we passed New York, we were going up across Brooklyn and uh, over to Long Island. All the night's lights in the city of New York, the brownout was lifted and all the lights came on. The biggest Christmas tree I've ever seen. About the uh, plane that was lost during your training, that was found years later. That's a fascinating story. You know, I should have brought. I, I was going through some stuff today, and, and I have a copy of the article. But one of our crews took off one night training program, 
uh, we were in Quonset Point, and they took off, uh, and it was the weather was terrible, snowing, cold, windy, and they never came back. So we spent three or four days, uh, days and nights, combing the area roughly between, well, not Boston was too far north, but we were around Providence most of the time, and that's, that Narragansett Bay is a huge, big thing looking all over for him and never did find him until that was in 43. So it had to be probably January sometime in the, along that area. And uh, just kind of keep your hand away from the, uh, the microphone. Oh, right yeah. Now. OK. So hold up for a second. Let me change my shot. Okay. We spent three or four days. I don't remember exactly how many. Uh, looking for him and had with no results whatsoever. So we took off and went down to West Palm Beach and on our way over to Africa. About, I'd have to look for sure, but I think it was about two or three years ago, the remains of a B-24 were found about 12 miles south and east, no, west, south and west of Block Island, which is a real resort area out of Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Connecticut. And that was the plane. The bodies were in there. Everybody was there. Uh, we had, there was nothing. The plane was just in, in the water. No evidence of crash or anything else. And the only thing that we could think of is uh, the pilots must have had vertigo. By the way, we did not have automatic pilots in those days. Everything, when the plane was flying, the pilot was flying it. And if he got uh, uh, disorganized, disoriented, uh, you, anything could happen. You, know, you, you try and fly him by the instruments, but if you have a real good case of vertigo, and a lot of, we've all had it, you get so you don't believe what the instruments are telling you. And when, they, when that happens, uh, anything can happen. We were coming back one night in, um, when we were flying out of Port Leote. We were on approach pull into the airport. Uh, the runway lights were lit. It, we were aimed at it, right lined up. And all of a sudden, they just disappeared. And one of the pilots said, oh, the lights went out. And the other one said, no, we're, you got vertigo. We're below. There was a hill just before you got to the base. And we just bounced off of the top of the hill, went up later on a day or two later, and saw the marks where our landing gear had hit the top. If it had been a foot lower, we'd have crashed. If it had been a foot higher, we wouldn't have known about it. Okay, uh, you want to get us down to the Azores and the fact that it was English only? And tell oh, us yeah, it was Portuguese. The Azores are Portuguese islands, and they have contracts or had a, treaties with the English that nobody would, other than the English could fly into their or and operate out of their air bases there. They had a great big base on uh, Lodgins, I think is the name of it, Terciera, that was the, the island. So when we were detached from England and sent down there, we had to have British markings, the uh, circle, the red, white, and blue circle painted on. We had, normally, you know, we have stars on our planes. Had to go in with Portuguese markings on the plane. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, there were apparently there was a German base on the other side of that island. They had the same kind of treaty with the Germans. And the one thing I had, didn't tell you, our first operational flight, when we got to Africa, we all had to fly up to, Linz, to Lisbon. And Lisbon has a great big harbor, and the Germans used that as a staging base for supplies. It sent all kinds of people and everything, ordnance, the whole bit, into Lisbon Harbor. And our job was to go up there and uh, drop a flare from about 4,000, 5,000 feet and take pictures of whatever that flare would light up. Well, they also had anti-aircraft guns up there, and the, uh, that was my introduction to being shot at. And the, um, I didn't tell you this story. 
the navigation table in a B-24, in our case, was in the after station back where the twin rudders were. And it was a table, and they were shooting at us, and, and we, had, we were all lit up. We had all these flares, the lights, going, and we were up there by ourselves, just one plane, flying around in a circle. And I don't, I must have blacked out, but I don't remember really when I finally, after we t left, or sometime after we we'd been shot at by these anti-aircraft guns, I realized that I had tried, been trying to hide underneath the navigation table, which was the worst place in the world. If I was going to get hit, I'd be the first one to get hit. <laughs> but fortunately, left, nothing happened, and we got back from it all right. I want to get to a couple of questions. When you're talking about uh, flying these anti-submarine patrols, you talk about these huge search flights and everything. Yes. Uh, did the submarines have any kind of anti-aircraft capability? Would that put you in danger of turning those things? Well, they had guns down there, but they had to be on the surface for that. Uh, you've seen them come up out of the water, and they have a gun mounted up in front or maybe on the conning tower. But we would be long gone if that was the case because we could pick up the feather from the, the uh, what I'm trying to the periscope, it left a feather, it, the, it's only sticking up out of the water about three feet, and it would leave a feather, and that's what we'd pick up on the radar, but the, the periscope, and that was the one bad thing about the radar in those days, which is not true now, but you couldn't tell, you couldn't identify whether it was a boat or a periscope, a whale or anything, but something on the surface. But you would never get them when you had the whole enough of the sub out of the water that, that somebody could get up to that gun and aim it and shoot it. And then it was, I don't know, a five-inch gun or four-inch or something. I'm not an armor person, so I don't really know. But to answer your question, though, uh, that was never anything that we were truly concerned with, except one time we had to go out there and escort a, a DE that had been torpedoed, and it's after, it was un, had almost underwater from midship to the fantail, and they were trying to get into England, and we went out and <laughs> herded them along for six or seven hours, and then somebody came out and relieved us. But what we were doing is flying a barrier for uh, to protect that ship from the sub, and some sub had it, had hit it, and they were probably in the area trying to hit it again. Did they make it? Yes, the ship got back. The Germans just had submarines out here. They didn't have surface ships, did they? They had some surface ships, but they were all either sunk or uh, corralled in South America. Remember when the Graf Spey was caught down there? It was in BA, I think, and uh, the, the uh, surface Navy, German surface Navy was of no real uh, concern, but boy, did they have the submarines. Man, oh man, they must have had 250 of them. I think at one time when we were still in England, and I was trying to remember just why these numbers came out, but it was something like in the first hundred days after D-Day, no, that's wrong, in the first 18 days after D-Day, the Allied surface ships and aircraft or whatever, whatever else had accounted for the loss, German loss, of 100 subs in the English Channel around that route that went one across the line. And I looked up, I saw in the history of the, our squadron today that we were flying a barrier patrol immediately south of the main highway across from England to Cherbourg. And that was our, we were protecting that area from any submarines that might be in there. Two things I wanted to <clears throat> mention. Uh, I didn't get the, you did trans, you did mature from navigator to pilot at some point. Yes, I? yes. Well, see, I, don't, I didn't pick that up. And also, when you were in the Azores, you were talking about the rolling square and how you did your... Oh, yeah, okay. Did you get into that part? 
That was just, we had in our aircraft, we had what, what are sauna boys. They still have them. They're a tube about as tall as that stand for that little display. It looked like something, uh, I always thought they looked like a fisherman where he kept these poles in these plastic things. We would drop them, and when they hit the water, they had a microphone that came out of the bottom. There was a water-soluble wax or something that allowed the microphone to drop down. And when the mic went, an antenna went up at the other end, and this thing would float. We could identify them because each sauna boy was on a different frequency, color-coded, and we'd be, it would be a red one or a blue one or a green, whatever. And in the airplane, we have a receiver, and we could flip the dial around and locate as any sound that was coming from any one of the color-coded sauna boys, and we'd know which one it was. We dropped them in a mile squared with a sauna boy in each corner of a square mile, and then we'd move on another, a next mile and drop a line of these things, uh, just like leaving a trail really, and see what we could hear. We wouldn't drop them until we knew that there was a sub in the area and you could hear it cavitate or somebody banging on it inside. But all that Santa Boy did was tell you it was somewhere near Santa Boy Green or Red or wherever that happened to be. What happened to that information? Oh, uh, we would... Uh, I don't know, I guess we had the radio that that was, we could give it a, we could pinpoint it with a location with a, I, I, I don't, I don't, what they, I don't know what the captain of the plane really did with it. I could tell him when I was listening to the Asana boy, I could tell him that we had a contact with something within a half a mile of Asana boy so-and-so, the green, red, and I could give him the latitude and longitude and minutes location of that Asana boy, and I assumed that he would have to send that information to the nearest uh, surface ship or something. There was no reason for us to drop a a uh, depth charge because when we did we had to drop a string of six and we would fly an angular path across where we thought that sub might be. We didn't try to hit it with one, it, we would go from stem to stern and angle it at like 30 degrees or something across where we thought that sub was. But we, we never could be sure a, a submarine could uh, release a whole bunch of debris the garbage that they let go and then you rise to the surface and they say that's where that is but we had no positive way of knowing that. Would you tell us how you what the transition from navigator to pilot how that happened what you did then? Well that's when I I did my tour as they promised they brought me back after I'd done a tour overseas I'd been over a year and I came back and they sent me to Ottumwa, Iowa, for, uh, Iowa, where I went through the primary training, the open cockpit thing that I was talking to you about. And then I went down, <coughs> went down to, I was sent down to Pensacola where I learned to fly seaplanes, PBYs, that sort of thing. And while I was there, the war ended. And in my case, they never discharged me. They always just gave me orders to inactive duty. And then I went back to school. Thank goodness for the GI Bill. I never would have gone to college had it not been for that. I went to school and uh, graduated from Ohio State. And all the time for the next, well, I got out in 46, 45, 46, got out in 46. I went to school, graduated in 47, and I was flying in the reserve out of NAS uh, Akron for the next uh, three and a half years, whatever that period was, until the Korean War came along. And I was in a squadron 
Uh, and uh, my work schedule was such that I, I would go down on whatever weekend I could make really make it. And they'd give me an airplane, and I just, uh, I, there was when an airplane was available, it'd be an SNJ or SNB or something. And I take off and go RON somewhere and fly out to St. Louis. I did that a lot, and then fly back just to maintain your proficiency. <coughs> and so, Korea. Get some water here. You can take a break. And... I'm running off at the mouth. I'm terrible. No, no, no. You're doing fine. <clears throat> Tell you what, we, you, you go on with that, but, uh, and just looking back, uh, I missed, you, you never got into that twin brother story. Oh, no, I didn't. And uh, you want to maybe refer to the Kennedy crash in England? Oh, yeah. Why don't you talk about those things? Well, let's go back to the, the uh, twin brother thing. That airplane that was missing and we never recovered, uh, it was standard in the service that and if you've been in, you know somebody is appointed to gather the effects of a deceased and pack them up and get them ready to send back to the family. And I was along with a couple of other guys uh, selected to go in and do pick, pick up the stuff, gather the stuff of one of the officers that was on that missing plane. And while we were in this hut, Quonset hut, putting the stuff together, um, I don't know whether you, in I don't know whether they do this now, but we aviators always had different uniforms than the regular Navy does. We had a green aviation uniform, it's a blouse and pants and the whole thing. And we were gathering gathering this stuff, and somebody said happened to look down at the doorway, and there, and lo and behold, was this guy that was missing walked in. And we just couldn't believe it because the crew didn't, nobody else from the crew was available, came back. We had no idea what happened, and this fellow walked in. We were just stunned, but it turned out that the missing aviator had a twin brother who was also an aviator. And uh, he was the one who came in to gather the remains and take care of them. And what was the other one? You, you you were in England when Kennedy crashed? Oh, yeah, yeah. We all flew out of a place called Duncanswell. It's halfway between Taunton and Exeter, an airfield there. And there were four uh, Navy squadrons up bringing out of there, one of which was, uh, I don't know the number of the squadron, but uh, one that John F. Kennedy, the original's son, number one son, of the senior Kennedy. Was this, was this young Joe Kennedy? Uh, Joe, yeah, Kennedy. Yeah, Joe, yeah, you Joe Kennedy Jr. Yeah, yeah, it was Joe Kennedy Jr. And he had been out on some sort of a mission. You, know, you never knew what these guys were doing. Uh, but had trouble coming back, and there was an emergency field uh, I can't tell you how far it was outside of London, but it was a grass field, so you could come in if you didn't have, couldn't get your gear down, you could still belly flop in it. And uh, he did, but he had a bomb in there that uh, was a very secretive thing. I just suppose, I have to guess, uh, that thing went off, and he, that's when he was killed. Uh, when he, that was, had to be right after D Day. Uh, nobody knows exactly what he was doing. The Queen Mary, I've got a note here, Queen Mary dumb luck story. Have we already? Yeah, that's the one when I told you that we just dropped down. Yeah, and then... okay. Okay. So you get called back and you go to Korea? No, I got, I got called back and uh, I was sent to what the, a, the Bureau of Aeronautics had an office at the Goodyear Aircraft Plant in uh, Akron, and since I lived in the area, that they sent me to that office for a while. I was there for, well, I guess I don't know, six, seven months, something like that. 
And then they sent me out to a Naval Air Facility at Litchfield Park, Arizona, which is just outside of Phoenix, where I was to fly and uh, represent them. Goodyear was building blimps, the whole the K ships. They built a lot of them out there. And I was kind of doing that and making sure I could fly again. I stayed there uh, about a year, maybe. And, and then I was assigned to a PBM squadron out of Alameda, California. And I got over there and was taking my annual physical, which I promptly flunked because my right eye was not 2020 anymore. So that made me a second class aviator, not first class. And second class aviators are not really desired. That means you got to have somebody else with you. You can't go solo. So I was, for all practical purposes, grounded. And they sent me from there out to Guam, where I was in a repair squadron. And then they needed somebody to man an outpost in Formosa. And they sent me up and uh, was in a little base that was a Navy base within a Chinese Air Force base in a town called Tainan. It's about 175 miles south of Taipei, with the capital of Formosa, Taiwan now. And I was there for uh, that's part of a year, I guess. Can you give us a date on this and how it relates to the Korean conflict, if it does? Oh, what were? well, I was a CEO of a base, forward base, on <clears throat> the island of Tai Taiwan in the town of Tainan, providing support, logistics, and so forth to a marine squadron that was flying mapping runs into China out of that base. Uh, it was maintained as a very secret base. Didn't, it's public now, but it was... And I stayed there as long as it was... Uh, they were doing, had that mission, the Marine Corps had that mission. And then I was sent back to the States and I did a two year tour of duty on the AirPac staff at San Diego. And then I was, uh, I got out of the Navy, I was released. Why don't you tell us uh, what your rank was when you were uh, <laughs> shot home and uh, if you have any reflections upon your involvement in World War II? Or any comments you want to make, philosophical or otherwise? Well, I was commissioned as an ensign in the Navy in 1943. Uh, when I was overseas, in, uh, I guess it was when we were down the Azores, I was promoted to lieutenant junior grade. Came back, I was flying out of the reserve about 1947, 8, 9, somewhere in there. I was promoted to full lieutenant, which is the same as a captain in the Army. And then while I was overseas at that secret base in Taiwan, I was promoted to lieutenant commander. And that's when I was retired. Well, I was a lieutenant commander. I still am lieutenant commander, retired. Non-pay, I might add. <laughs> uh, and that's my status at this point. Do you feel like what you, your service was meaningful to the World War II efforts? Have you got any thoughts about that? It just embarrasses me to see the, what the American public thinks of the military now. Everybody in my age group was clamoring and knocking on the door to get in. We wanted in. It was a popular war. We were doing something that we all thought was right. Uh, it was not a political football like it is now. We didn't have, everybody went, wanted to win. We don't have that kind of an attitude now. I'm very disappointed in the public and our politicians. Uh, we're in it. Uh, I cannot, in the, for the life of me, understand. I can understand people disagree with the fact that we're in this thing and somebody's getting killed. They're talking about we're killing 3,000 people. Uh, in how long have we been over in uh, Iraq? Four years? Three and a half? Three years? Killed 3,000 people. 
we used to have death lists come out daily in the papers. There'd be 3,000 a day uh, in World War II. And I just, I can't understand. There must be some American people that hate America. I can't understand that. And I honestly, I don't understand why people literally hate Nick uh, Bush. I can't understand that. Have an absolute hate. They don't know how bad people hated uh, Roosevelt. You know, he's elected four times to be president of the United States. Uh, he, there was all kinds of evidence, I, rumors that he knew he, he caused the Japanese war. He allowed it to happen. But you try and say that now, boy, it's just. But on the other hand, that was a popular war, and he was a popular president. Yes, that's true. It certainly was a popular war, and he was a popular president. I want to get back to a couple other questions here, guys. Yeah. Uh, you talked about flying the B-24, flying yeah. on the B-24. Were these pretty heavily modified from the, the bomber configurations? No. The radar, yeah. or they, did you fly with the same amount of crew members? And yes. Specialists? You've got a picture of them. Uh, we had 12, 12 people assigned to a crew. Uh, when we went, I don't know how many, we had it, uh, 12 planes and 18 crew members in, each, in the squadron. We all went to England and then after the, uh, we'd been there I don't know, three, four, five weeks, something like that. That's when they decided to break us up and we were a detachment that was sent down to the Azores. But as far as the configuration of the airplane, no, there was no change except the old B-24. It had a greenhouse in front. There was just glass all over the front of it. They took, the Navy took that out and put a ball turret in it and it rotated in all the directions except backwards. Uh, it had a, uh, we left the, the uh, top turret in. The, that was left, the bottom turret, the, was taken out and that's where the radar was. And we had to be careful when we came back and landed, make, the, make sure we pulled that up. Or a couple of landings, I think they tore the radar out. And their radar wasn't something you could just go in and take off the shelf. It was brand new. And it was, radar today is so accurate, you just can't believe. And then ours, we had, the dial was about, oh, six inches in diameter. It was on an arm that swung back and forth between the pilot and the co-pilot, and I had one in the nav station back in the after station. And <clears throat> when you get real close to the target, we had what was grass. It just looked like fuzz coming out of the settler. You look at the glass of uh, the screen, and there's a pin or something holding that in there, and the grass just seemed to grow out of it. So as you moved in on a target, you'd see this thing coming down. You were head, headed for it. You'd see it moving down on the screen, and then you'd get in the grass, and you get, that had no idea what happened to it. You just had to hope and pray that you were on a straight line to go hit it and get it. And that was why we had the, the big searchlight out there that you could swing it around. And because when you got within a couple of miles, there, there was no way you could pick it out and identify it in the radar screen scope. What altitude were you flying? <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's funny. We got our planes when we were in Norfolk and we were learning to fly them and our, our, what positions we had. And one of the things we had to do one time was see what altitude we could get out of these things. Service altitude. When, that's when you can't go above 100 feet a second or a minute when you're trying to climb out. Uh, we got up to about 28,500 something, and we proved that the oxygen system worked. We all had masks. We had heavy, heavy leather coats and pants and sheep lined and all of this stuff, electric uh, uh, flight suits to keep us warm. Left the United States, went down to West Palm Beach, 
I don't think we ever got above 5,000 feet from then on. And during the war, we flew at about 1,500 to get the maximum distance we could get out of the radar, which was 90 miles. And as soon as you got any kind of a target, you dropped down to 100 feet. And we had that, that something else the other planes didn't have. We had a right radar altimeter. We had a radar measuring the distance because the, the regular Colesman's thing is not very accurate. You just put a set, put a, a pressure reading in it, and whatever that says is close to where you are. But you're flying at night, and you're 100 feet off the water, and you don't know whether the waves are like this or like that. It sure was nice to have that uh, radar altimeter, because that, that told you where you were within two feet. But nobody else had them. They just, uh, Honeywell had to send people over and teach us how to operate the, the uh, radar altimeters and also the automatic pilot. The automatic pilot, you, today you just push a button and it's hooked up and going. I do it on my flight simulator that I have at home. But they had three buttons going and the lights would be flipping up back and forth and that told you that you're your uh, ailerons and your elevator and everything else was running all right. You were, everything was working. They called them servos, those extra little motors they had in there. But you were talking about one other <coughs> incident, flying a little too low. You were talking about vertigo. Did you actually feel the bump when you were Oh, running? sure. Yeah, yeah, but you talk, that bump just felt like any other bump you had to get. You've been, been in an airplane, you get a little rough air, it bounces. And, you can't tell really. If you're trying to land it, you assume you probably hit the ground. <laughs> but I have one other question. Go back to when you had been in college and you, you were joining up. Did you always want to fly, or did it just seem like an attractive thing to do once you were entering the service and getting the opportunity? I've got to tell you this story. Uh, I had an uncle. Uh, who must have run away from home in World War I. And he went over to France and he flew in something close to the Lafayette Escadrille. It wasn't with Rickenbacker and others, but he learned to fly and he ran, flew those things that were held with bailing wire and chewing gum. Came back to the States, a complete alcoholic. He had to be drunk, I think, to <laughs> go fly those things over there. And you know, some of those airplanes didn't, the prop didn't turn, the whole engine turned. They had rotary <laughs> engines that, a rotary engine on some of those really turned. Uh, I don't think it was very successful, but uh, something that they tried. At any rate, my, this uncle, uh, I always liked him. I, he was a friendly guy, he was funny. Uh, he had three millionaire wives that he went through, I guess, drank them out of all their money. But he had a flight school, and he flew, fleet, well, he had a Jenny. Uh, the first airplane I was ever in was a Jenny. Uh, boy, that's an old airplane. He took me up for a ride. And later on, he got two fleets. Now, if you ever go to the Air and Space Museum in San Diego, and you go through, it's a big horseshoe. <coughs> in the beginning, you see all these early airplanes, and you get around about the middle, and you're seeing airplanes that, and these are real planes in there, uh, that were in World War I. And there is one of those fleets. And I go, every time I've been to San Diego, I will go over and look at that. And then there's a PBY hanging right in the middle of the museum, too. But, uh, and then as a kid, I must have built a million little old airplanes, gliders and that sort of thing. So I always wanted to be an aviator. I really did. Fly after you got out of service? No, can't afford it. I want to ask one other thing, and this is this goes back to uh, when you were just talking earlier. You're talking about the amount of, I think we're talking about Liberty ships for the most part. But yeah. Twenty would go out, and the, that's an amazing amount of ships that were lost. We lost an amazing amount of ships, really. They, uh, those convoys would form up on the East Coast, Boston, New York. Uh, Norfolk, all along the coast, and uh, the route really was from there to Murmansk. They were trying to get to Murmansk, 
And the German submarines were just out there by the zillions. And literally, uh, they were lucky if they got two of, them, two of those ships through. They really did. The, that's when, when they finally got a hold of uh, Do you remember? Oh, you know, Mr. Roosevelt, in one of his better moves, he did something that was as le illegal. Uh, Abu Ghraib here is, is nothing. To compare. He gave 50 of our U.S. destroyers on a, quote, Lend-Lease program, which they had tore up as soon as they'd signed it, gave it to the British so they had, would have some protection to, for the ships that were supposed to get into England. But England was bombed, being all bombed. I was in, one, in London one time, and I just can't tell you how many buzz bombs came on. And boy, those were really something. You could hear them coming. And then the engines would cut out. Now, I don't know what the altitude was, I had no idea. But you knew that they were circling, and you didn't know where that damn thing was going to come down. Uh, my co pilot and I were in Paddington Station one night trying to get on a train to go back to the base. We'd been up there illegally for a weekend liberty. Basket leave is what we had. And Paddington Station, a passenger thing on one side of the Thames River and a marshalling yard on the opposite side where all the railroad stuff came in. And I don't know how many times that marshalling guy, the job got hit, but you never knew. All you heard was the, that's why they were called buzz bombs. You heard the buzz and then it stopped and you had no idea where it was going. And the English, you can't believe the, what they went through, it's just amazing. Did you get to know many of the English people when you were there? Uh, no, not really. Uh, we didn't have much time. We, uh, we flew every every third night for sure, and if they needed somebody else, we'd fly the uh, odd, one of the odd nights. And we were on the base, and there was no place to go except the Exeter Hotel downtown. We had a better officer's club than the hotel had. Uh, we'd go down there, and uh, as I remember, if you wanted a glass of beer, you ordered Either ale or cider, I can't remember which, but the other, if it was the other way, then you ordered the, different, the other, other one. And, uh, and they ran out at 7 o'clock at night anyway, so there was nothing to do. Uh, No, Bill, I just think that was a marvelous interview. And I know we, we all appreciate you coming down and giving us your time. Well, it's They'd like to look over your memorabilia. Oh, okay. And if you don't mind, probably leave some of it with them. Is that all right with you? Yeah. Pictures you, are things that we can scan and we can use with the oh, air. Um, I think the, the blue folder is a, an award for an air medal. Air medal isn't very far up on the scale. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't deserve anything <laughs> very far up on the scale. But I had gotten, when I got out of the Navy and I was in school at uh, Ohio State, I got a notice from the Navy that I, I, along a whole bunch of other people, had been awarded an Air Medal for what we had done. I had no idea. But if I wanted to have a ceremonial a presentation. If I'd come to New York and go down to 90 Church Street, I could stand there and go through one, and I didn't particularly want to go to New York, and so I said, send it to me, which they did, and I've got it home in the Bureau, I guess. Well, that was in 1946, probably, 45 or 6, somewhere in there. Now, I've been flying a lot, and it is now, was, 2006. I went up to the mailbox where I just recently moved. <clears throat> there was an envelope from the 11th Naval District in there. 
I said, what the heck is that? I don't have anything to do. I'm retired. I got a piece of paper that says I'm USNR retired. Opened it up, and that blue folder was in it. And it says that I'm getting another star for my, uh, since I already have one air medal, I'm getting another one for something I did. And you read the award, and it says back in something in 19... Oh, some September to October or sometime in 44, I think. I looked in my logbook and I can't see anything I did. I, but we, we were flying, it's in there when I, the day, how long we flew and what we were doing, a night searchlight mission and that's all it says. But there it is, so I got another air medal. And don't know why I got it. It's got real flowery words, you know. You'd think I'd saved what George Washington, but my goodness. <laughs> well, even if you don't remember, at least somebody remembered. So. I think they made a mistake. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when you were there at the time on Formosa, um, you talked about the Marines. You know, kind of, were you around Marines at that time? Or were you oh, they were flying out of my base. Okay, that was... they, they were housed there. Uh, they had a, they were flying F4, F4S, I guess, one of the really early model uh, jet planes. And they flew in, in uh, units of two. One plane had a camera and the other plane was armed. And they flew, they had pre-planned routes into China. They flew a 400 mile run straight in and turned around like a mow a lawn, moved over another lap or whatever, and came back out taking pictures. <coughs> the arm plane, of course, was a guard. It was a, a Marine squadron. I have no idea what the, oh, I know. I had to give them, uh, what they call them? Escape and evasion rings. <coughs> Gold rings worth about $2,000 a piece that they could use if they were shot down. Or, They'd have something to negotiate. The, the CEO of that outfit, his, his claim to fame was that he was the only guy that could take off, do a loop, and come in, land exactly where he was when he took off. 